All right, what's up everybody? Welcome back for another video. Today we're gonna to be doing something that I think a lot of us are actually doing right about this time of year, and that is brewing an Irish dry stout. Obviously this is being brewed in celebration of a certain holiday in March and is modeled after a certain famous Irish beer. But there's definitely still a little bit of creative liberty that we can take within the style to keep it from being a total clone of Guinness. Um, but we're going to go for something that's close to it but slightly different and has a personal spin on it. But what I want to say before anything really is that this is actually a really easy beer to make. Uh, so if you're just starting out as an all-grain brewer and uh, you don't have that many brews under your belt yet, this is probably a really good one to think about uh, that might impress your friends, that's pretty forgiving, that'll come out pretty good. So so hopefully if you're new to the hobby, you'll be able to get something good out of this video and, uh, you know, by all means, go for it. Try something like this and uh, I think you'll be very pleased with the results. So we're going for something that's a rather sessionable beer, hopefully under 5% by just a hair. Um, and it really should have just a whole ton of flavor, lots of roast, uh, lots of body, but still high drinkability. Uh, the recipe is actually really simple. Normally we think of big, heavy, black stouts that have tons and tons of different specialty malts and full flavor and high finishing gravities and all that, high ABV, this is completely opposite of that. So I'm gonna go through the recipe here and talk about how each ingredient is gonna actually affect the final beer. So starting out, we have seven pounds of Irish stout malt. Um, this is basically just a malt with some really fat kernels. So that's gonna mean that you're actually not gonna need as much malt as you normally would to get the same efficiency as you would with say two row. Uh, if you can't find specialty Irish stout malt, it's basically just UK pale malt. Uh, so if you can get Golden Promise, that's another good one, or Maris Otter, both of those will be fine and they'll have the same effect. We're adding then two and a half pounds of flaked barley. That's a lot of flaked barley, but what that's gonna do is give you that really kind of quintessential smooth mouthfeel you expect from this kind of beer, um, and it's going to really make the creaminess of it come to the forefront. We're gonna add a pound and a quarter of roasted barley. That's actually a ton of roasted barley um, for most beers, but this is absolutely a signature of this style, and it's really kind of the only primary specialty malt for this. Um, and that's gonna give you that, that perfect roasty character that you get from Guinness or other Irish type stouts. Uh, so optional in this beer is a little bit of chocolate malt as well if you want a little extra roast, but I'm not gonna include that today for the sake of simplicity. Last but not least, we're adding six ounces of acid malt. What this is gonna do is add a nice little bite of tartness uh, to the final beer, which is characteristic of the style. So we're gonna mash this at 151 degrees for 60 minutes. This is gonna keep the uh, level of uh, unfermentable sugars low because we don't want this to be sweet. It is a dry stout, so it hopefully finishes below 1010 specific gravity. Um, so we wanna keep that mash temperature on the lower side instead of doing a uh, full bodied sweet kind of stout that you would say for like an imperial stout or an oatmeal stout, you'd want a higher mash temperature. So for hops, we are going to do uh, 1.7 ounces of East Kent Goldings at uh, 60 minutes. And that is a, basically that's however much you need to get to roughly 30 to 34 IBUs of bitterness from your bittering addition. I am adding one ounce of East Kent Goldings at 10 minutes for aroma. This is not called for by the style, um, but I think it would be interesting and it might add a little extra complexity. So East Kent Goldings is a nice earthy type of hop. Um, you're really not looking for hop flavor from this, but it should complement the roasted malts if it comes through. Uh, for yeast, we are using the Y Yeast 1084 Irish Ale. This is kind of your standard option for this beer. Um, it's not known to be the most attenuative strain of yeast, but I think it's gonna be all right. We're not doing a starter because our OG is gonna be low enough that we can just pitch one straight packet of yeast um, without any issues. You can choose to make a starter if you want to. It's only going to help you, uh, but I don't think it's necessary in this brew. I'm gonna do some water additions in this beer uh, just to kind of make it a little bit nicer. Uh, we're looking for a higher ratio of chloride to sulfate, um, something along the lines of two to one chloride to sulfate. Uh, this is going to bring out the malty flavors of the beer a bit more and it's going to taste more pleasant. Be aware if you flip this around and you do sulfates to chlorides, you will have a drier feeling beer and it will have a little bit more hop bitterness, so maybe tone down the hops if you choose to do that. 
However, it's not going to hurt your beer to have one or the other. There's no right answer here with this one because it's a forgiving beer. So if you are brand new and you don't do water chemistry yet, totally fine. I get it, can be, it can be kind of intimidating um, and it's not totally necessary to make a good beer with. However, it does help quite a bit. I am doing 82 parts per million of calcium, 10 parts per million of magnesium, 65 parts per million of sodium, 78 parts per million of sulfate, 123 parts per million of chloride, and 93 parts per million of carbonate. Now, everyone's base water is going to be different, so you do need to calculate your own additions of salts to add to this, but I am adding 4 grams of gypsum, 2 grams of epsom, 2 grams of calcium chloride, and 4 grams of chalk to the brewing water. So. I have treated both my mash water and my strike water uh, with these chemicals as well as adding a Camden tablet to the uh, whole thing just to get rid of any sort of city uh, chlorine compounds from the water because uh, those can be pretty nasty in the final beer. So now I'm waiting for my mash to get up to temp and uh, pretty soon we'll be doughing in. So I will catch you then. All right, so everything is up to temp and uh, we're actually ready to dough in now. Um, but I want to make a note that I have a system that's slightly different than what most people probably have. Um, my system will recirculate wort throughout the entire mash. Um, this is not necessary. It, it's just another step that I take to kind of maintain a little bit more uh, clarity in the wort and it kind of helps my final beer a little bit, but uh, I want to make a point that that's not necessary at all for this style. So because of the recirculation, I actually dough in at my mash temperature because the mash temperature will fall and then come right back up to uh, the intended temperature because of the recirculation. Now, if you don't have a system like this and you're just working with like your standard igloo cooler, that's totally fine. You're going to make great beer with that. Um, just look up online a calculator or something where you can figure out what uh, strike temperature you need to hit and then you can dough in from there and be accurate with your temperatures. So I'm going to go ahead and remove the recirculation piece of this and dough in real quickly. Alright, so now we want to make sure that we stir this real good. Make sure you don't have any dough balls or clumps uh, in the mash there, because that's going to affect your efficiency. Get that all distributed nicely. All right, so we're about 10 minutes into the mash now, so it means it's time to check the pH. Uh, normally, I just use these pH strips um, instead of an actual pH meter, and that's just because I don't really have the budget for one of those right now. Yeah, it'll come eventually, but for now, these will do because they're just precise enough to get us in the right neighborhood. Uh, I think we're actually about in the right area, so uh, pH is looking like it's somewhere between 5 and 5.5, .5, which is where you want it. Uh, in the mash. So we're going to go ahead and let that sit for the rest of the mash, which is another hour. All right, so uh, the mash has been going for a full hour now. Uh, so it's time to go ahead and start collecting all this work. So I'm going to start by turning off the heat, turning off the pump, and closing up all of our ball valves here. All right, so I got about seven gallons from my first runnings, and uh, we need a pre-boil volume of about eight gallons uh, in order for this to be a successful brew day. So I'm gonna go ahead and batch sparge with about uh, a gallon and a quarter of water. This is a one quart dipper uh, that I'm gonna use to get this 170 degrees sparge water put into the, uh, the grain bed here. And I'm just batch sparging. This is what I normally do, and it has worked out well for me always in the past. All right, and we'll let that sit for about another 10, 15 minutes and uh, let the sugars get rinsed off. And then we'll go ahead and transfer the rest of the second runnings over. All right, so I just finished collecting my second runnings. Sorry, I kind of forgot to film that, but we have a total of eight gallons in here right now. Um, so 
What I'm going to do now is go ahead and take the bag and the grain out of this kettle and clean it up. And then we'll go ahead and transfer all of the wort from here back into this kettle and then we'll start the boil. Okay, so our pre-boiled gravity sample is in and uh, it looks like it's about nine bricks, which uh, with my refractometer and a dark wort corrects to about uh, a pre-boiled gravity of about 1034, which is one point lower than we were aiming for with 1035 as our estimated. So uh, that's pretty good. Sets us up for a reasonable uh, boil. All right, so we just hit our boil. So now it's time to add our bittering hops addition, which is the 1.7 ounces of East Kent Goldings. So in they go into the hop spider. And uh, now we literally just wait uh, for another 50 or five zero minutes until 10 minutes are left in the boil, in which case I'm gonna add some more stuff. All right, so we have now about 10 minutes left in the boil. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and add my <laughs> elected aroma addition, which is not normal in this beer at all, but that's one ounce of East Kent Goldings going right into the hop spider. Uh, I think I missed a little bit there, so that's good. The other thing that is very important, I think, in this style is uh, some yeast nutrient. Um, I typically add this to every single beer, and that's kind of just a guarantee that the yeast is going to have a little extra help in the fermentation. Uh, but I'm adding two and a half teaspoons of that, uh, and I do that pretty much now with every single beer. Um, in this style, we want it to finish really as dry as we can get it. So uh, that's gonna help contribute to that factor. Okay, so now with 10 minutes left in the boil, I've added all that stuff as you saw earlier. Uh, this is my plate chiller. This is a very important piece of equipment um, that allows me to chill the wort very quickly. I am going to start recirculating boiling wort through this, and that is going to sanitize the inside of it, as well as the inside of the pump that I use to pump everything through this. So we're gonna maintain that for the next 10 minutes through the boil. Basically, this allows me to guarantee that the inside of this does not contain any live bacteria that's going to contaminate the beer. Uh, so we're just gonna start setting that up now. Every so often, that happens. Okay, so I've set my uh, chilling system up where the uh, wort is going from the kettle to the pump to the chiller back into the kettle. We're gonna start by opening up uh, the valve here that's gonna prime the pump. Then we can pump from there back into the kettle. We're gonna recirculate this for the next 10 minutes. So not only is that gonna sanitize the inside of all this equipment, but that's also going to encourage the uh, proteins and hop debris and any other sort of tube type things uh, to coagulate in the center because I have this set at an angle. So it's gonna actually whirlpool the entire thing. Um, so that's gonna help generate clearer wort uh, into the fermenter at the end of this process. Well, during the process of actually transferring the wort into the fermenter, my camera completely died. So I lost all the footage that I had of actually aerating the wort and transferring it in there. So basically aerating the wort is very important for any beer style. You uh, typically want about an inch or two of foam on the surface of the wort right before you pitch the yeast. That is an indicator of dissolved oxygen in the wort, which is important for yeast health pre-fermentation. Post-fermentation, oxygen is very bad. We don't want that. It decreases uh, shelf life of the beer, basically. But pre-fermentation, it's very important. Um, I did this by basically just holding my hose uh, 
basically this far off the uh, the wort here and uh, ensuring that it was splashing into the fermenter and just creating lots and lots of bubbles. Uh, that's what we really want at the end of the day. But um, here we have the actual uh, oxygenated wort and uh, <laughs> I put a fresh battery in the camera so now we have that. Okay, so uh, our original gravity is uh, showing on my refractometer as about 11 and a half bricks, which is equivalent to an original gravity of about 1.044, which is two points lower than our expected original gravity, which is pretty great. So overall, uh, we hit our numbers more or less, and uh, we should expect the beer between four and 5% uh, ABV by the time this is completely finished. Anyway, um, it is time to pitch the yeast. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, take this sanitized packet of Irish ale yeast from Y Yeast here. And open that up and we're pitching. And now, And now we'll cap that up. And we'll let that sit for a uh, couple weeks and I'll catch up to you when fermentation is complete. So after a rather frustrating fermentation, the final gravity of the beer is parked at about 1014. Uh, it's as low as it's gonna get, despite a lot of trying to get it lower. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and keg it tonight. All right, so we are finally at the tasting section of this video. And uh, well, so fermentation did not quite go as expected. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, this is one of those times that it didn't. It took a long time to ferment out uh, with this particular yeast, which is strange because that's very much not the reputation that this yeast has. Uh, typically people see Irish stouts fermenting out in like a couple days. Uh, mine took three weeks. I don't know, maybe the yeast wasn't super healthy. So I could have made a starter in order to have a really good, consistent, you know, issue-free fermentation, but I bought all those ingredients that morning, so I didn't really have a time to actually make a starter. But I think the yeast might have had something to do with that, particularly high final gravity. So we were definitely not shooting for a final gravity that high, but that's okay. Uh, it still tastes pretty good. So I'm gonna go ahead and pour the beer now, and we'll talk about it. All right, so I called this one March Gladness, which is kind of, you know, a spin off of March Madness. Uh, it comes at about 4% ABV and 34 IBUs. So the appearance of the beer is pretty black. Um, it's got a dark tan head. Um, the color is actually, if you, if you look deeply at the color, you'll see it's actually a, a very dark brown, not a jet black, um, but that's actually the way that these Irish stouts are supposed to be. The head is pretty robust on the beer, but it does fade after a little while, um, but it does leave a good decent layer on the surface that does stick around for the life of the pint. Uh, unfortunately, I do not have this on a nitro system because I do not have space nor money for a nitro system, um, but it does pretty well on CO2 anyway. Um, it's just not gonna be as creamy and the, the head is definitely not going to be nearly as uh, pillowy and awesome as a nitro stout uh, would otherwise be. As you can see, it's a little over carbonated right now, but I'm, it's okay. I'm just having some issues with my kegerator. Uh, the lines are a little bit too long, I think. Uh, it's causing a lot of foam on some of my beers. So uh, for aroma, it's got a real nice kind of coffee roast type aroma. A little earthiness. I think the East Kent Goldings that I added for aroma are coming through. In kind of like an earthy, musty kind of way. Um, pretty, you know, pretty English type of uh, aroma there. So, not too pungent. But uh, that's, that's okay, it's you know, not meant to be an overwhelming beer in terms of aroma. Uh, so now we'll go in for a mouthfeel. It's got like a medium bodied mouthfeel. Um, 
it's not as smooth and creamy as it would be if it was on nitro so it's not you know got a super thick mouthfeel like an imperial stout would you know it's it's not very uh heavy on alcohol so that definitely lends to uh, not having a very big mouthfeel it's not really a thin bodied mouthfeel either i mean it's very drinkable uh and it's got a very uh dry finish even though it didn't really have a dry fi uh, final gravity there but um now the flavor doesn't last very long in the mouth so it encourages you to take a larger sip um but the uh the overall mouthfeel definitely is medium i would say uh and not too uh not too aggressive it's not really um yeah, it's not creamy, it's not chalky, none of the minerals really come through. It just kind of feels dry, which it should. Alright, now on to flavor. So it's um, it's actually a little bit bitter. Um, I think there might be a little too much hop bittering in this. So it's a little aggressive on the bittering edition, but the flavor does have a very pleasant roast and, uh, you know, yeah, I put a ton of roasted barley in this, but it really does come through as, um, as a smooth roast, not an acrid roast. Uh, it just blends really well. So there is a little bit of an acidic bite, actually, at first. Um, and I added the acid malt for that reason. That's a characteristic of the beer I'm basing this off of. And it comes through nicely. It's not overpowering. It's not harsh to drink at all. Um, it just kind of lends a little slightly acidic tinge to the whole thing slight sourness not not like yeah it's not like a bacteria sour it's it's like just an acid sour um you know not really don't really dig into that too much it's not really a very uh apparent thing until you're looking for it just kind of something that adds a little sharpness to the the front uh It's other than that, it's really pretty much just dominated by a good, smooth, uh, coffee roast type flavor. And um, there's actually a slight little bit of nuttiness uh, coming through on the back, like a hazelnut almost uh, flavor, which is really pleasant. Yeah. I mean, it tastes very clean uh, for, for a stout. And uh, it's quite simple. I think it's very approachable. You know, it's, it's definitely a, it's not a heavy drinking beer. It's a nice, sessionable 4%, and uh, you can have a couple of these and feel fine. Um, so I really actually am pretty pleased with the way it turned out. I do wish it had gotten a little drier. I personally don't mind having a little bit of extra hot bitterness up front. It might be a little too much for the style, but I think... Uh, I don't mind it personally. So I did pour this thing kind of cold because in my keyser I'm still lagering a Doppelbach that's been sitting there for like two months now and it's still going. So all of my beers have been very cold as they're poured, but as this warms up the flavor definitely changes a little bit. It gets, uh, it gets a little bit fuller and you get a little bit more of the nuttiness I'm talking about on the back as it warms up. And I think it actually, it doesn't have as much of a um, uh, a sharp bite as much when it gets a little bit warmer too. Ideally, this beer is actually served at a rather low pressure and at a uh, much warmer temperature, something like 50 degrees Fahrenheit. But that's all right, you know, it, it still tastes pretty good when it's cold too. Don't get me wrong. So anyway, as far as the improvements on the beer... Um, I think I could definitely do with a little bit less hot bitterness up front. I think that's just a matter of dialing back that bittering up addition just a little tiny bit. Nothing wrong with that. I keep the aroma addition. I think that's nice. It adds a nice earthy element to it um, that I definitely uh, find welcome in this beer. Um, I think I would add a little extra flaked barley because that would boost the mouthfeel a little bit. I think it's still... Uh, the flaked barley is supposed to kind of add a smoothness to the mouthfeel. And it didn't really come through. And I also think I may not have converted it all. Um, so maybe the next time I give myself a little bit longer mash rest, perhaps. 
But honestly, like, the biggest thing that would make this better would be having it on Nitro. <laughs> Plain and simple, that just changes the character of this beer so much. Like, if you've ever had a Guinness that's on CO2 versus a Guinness that's on Nitro, it's like night and day. So, uh, if you do have the ability to get a Nitro system and a Stout faucet, it's... I, I envy you, sir or ma'am, because that is just such an awesome thing to have. Um, I don't have it yet, but maybe in the future, maybe I can pull that off. Um, but either way, this is pretty solid for a CO2 version of an Irish Stout. I'm gonna give it, uh, I'm gonna give it a healthy 8 out of 10, I think. Um, it's a pretty good execution of the style. Not the best. Um, it definitely needed to get lower in terms of final gravity. It needed to finish drier, but it didn't. And, uh, well, next time, hopefully it will. And that's a matter of just rebrewing it and making sure I have a, a lot more yeast next time, I think. There's no like, there's no off flavors in terms of under pitching. It's not fruity, it's not uh, hot tasting. So it definitely fermented like well. It just didn't ferment the best it could have fermented. So thanks for making it all the way to the end of the video. If you're still watching, I appreciate it. Uh, if you really like this kind of stuff, please give it a thumbs up. It really helps my channel become a lot more relevant. A thumbs up, a subscribe, and a comment. All of those things really help me out. And I love actually talking with everybody. I, so I honestly read every single comment that I get. And I do my best to respond to as many of them as I can. So please leave a comment down below and I'll get back to you. Yeah, so I try to post a new video roughly every two to three weeks. But that does depend on how fast I can brew and how fast I can get rid of beer that's in kegs. Uh, but that's generally about the time frame that I upload to YouTube with. Um, however, if you want more frequent updates on the order of every few days, please feel free to follow me on Instagram. That's at the apartment brewer on Instagram, and there you'll see more frequent updates in real time, and you can see what's going to be coming to the YouTube channel in a few weeks, uh, which is always exciting. Last but certainly not least, if you want to brew this beer for yourself, there's a recipe in the description box down below that should be complete. Um, but also down there you'll find links to all of my equipment and where you can buy it on Amazon if you wish to do so. Just be advised that if you do buy something on Amazon using one of those links, uh, then I do earn a very small commission, but it's at no additional cost to you. And it's a great way to help support the channel. So, thank you very much for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed the video, and maybe you got something useful out of it. Maybe I inspired you to brew your own Irish stout. Um, I know it's a little late to do that for St. Paddy's Day 2020, but, uh, you know, it's definitely a good beer to enjoy at any time of year. And, uh, speaking of which, I'm gonna go ahead and finish off the rest of this while I'm actually brewing a, uh, English bitter right now, so... <laughs> I'll get back to that, but I will catch you guys in the next one. Cheers. Cheers.